Good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about the national economy. Now, so far in this unit, we focused on microeconomics, the individual, the family, maybe the business, or just the local community. We're going to spread out a lot more to the macro level, which is national and international economics. Now, we've touched on this before. Government has a lot of impact on our economy, certainly a lot more than our founding fathers thought. Uh, in addition to simply passing laws for protecting law and order, they protect property rights, not just physical property, but that intellectual property. So if you write a song or create software, something like that, your government is going to ensure, if you follow the rules, that your rights are protected. National defense, it's about $780 billion a year. That's not a small part of our economy. Uh, provide public services, health care, the education you're getting right now. Uh, a lot of that's paid through taxes. We're going to find out what that's all about in this presentation as well. But just to kind of give you some idea of what we're talking about, when I say the U.S. economy depends far more on uh, the government than it did in previous years. Around 1928, this is the general role of the government when it comes to our economy. You can see that private business was 88%. Now, the Great Depression and New Deal hit. All of a sudden, that 12% of government spending increased to 24%. Now, you would think after the Great Depression and the New Deal reforms came into effect, it wouldn't go any larger. But you also have to remember World War II, the Cold War, uh, American economic expansion, the uh, war on poverty that we would have in the 1960s. Uh, we're paying almost half. It's 43% of, of the economy comes from government expenditure, local, state, and federal. It is a huge part of our economy. Another way that they regulate, uh, that would be uh, through fairness, competition, growth. We're talking about uh, laws and, and agencies that are put into place in order to make sure businesses have a fair playing field. But we also have to consider the individuals. So the effort to reduce poverty and inequality in the U.S. economically and otherwise. Now, as you can see, about 13% of Americans live at or below the poverty line. Uh, you're talking about 42 million, somewhere around there. Uh, Nevada is right around 13%, so about the national average. But as you can see from this map here, uh, the American South, where former slavery uh, had a huge sway, uh, has large numbers. In fact, almost 20% of those in some of the states uh, are in poverty. And then, of course, New Mexico, large numbers of Native Americans who were forced onto the reservations, didn't have a lot of options. So we've talked about the functions of government in general. I want to talk in specific about some of those actions and, and uh, options that the U.S. government has. Government can restrict trade through a tariff. That's a tax on imported goods. So um, you see up on the screen here that the U.S. passed $34 billion worth of additional taxes on imported goods from China. China responded with $34 billion of taxes that would have to be paid on American goods imported into their country. So if you're putting a tax on something that's imported into your country, your goal is to make foreign goods more expensive, your goods cheaper, therefore people will use your goods. Uh, we saw the same thing with the automobiles. Europe, over a million European automobiles are imported to the United States. We put a 2.5% tariff on that, a tax. They immediately turned around and hit the very small number of vehicles that we export there, about a quarter million, uh, with a 10% tariff. Uh, the second thing is a quota. That's simply a limit on the number of items, whether it's a product or immigration, for example. Having a limitation on the product or the number of people or the type of people you're going to bring in uh, it sets a parameter that's going to be consistent year after year. That's been a government policy for a long time. An embargo is where you completely cut off all trade with a nation or a company. Now, right now, we sort of kind of have an embargo with Russia. But if you look back at the past, we had an embargo when we were colonies with Great Britain. Uh, the majority of colonists said, nope, we're not buying British products. We're not going to pay the British tax. That would be an embargo. Uh, in 1960, shortly after the fall of the old Cuban government and the rise of a communist nation there, uh, the U.S. slapped Cuba with an embargo. That lasted 65 years until President Obama, in his second term, decided to drop the embargo, and now we have begun to trade with Cuba again. 
Uh, and then standards. You know, we talk about those agencies and those laws. It's restricting products that don't meet those basic requirements or we have additional things that they must meet, these additional benchmarks. Uh, on cans of soup, if it's using genetically engineered organisms, obviously GMO has to be listed on the label. When you think of farm subsidies, government can either cut the cost, say through a tax break, uh, or provide money. Uh, any of these things are options. You can see farm subsidies equal about $53 billion. And supporting those internal domestic industries, it's also done with the same tools I just showed you before. What hurts foreign trade generally, not always, but generally helps American trade. All right, let's get past this video. Although I do recommend um, look up government shutdown Vox. That's really interesting. So let's talk about some of the ways that our government measures it. Now we've already done some activities with GDP and that's a measure of all the goods and services that a country has within that year, whether it's owned by that country or not, what occurs within its borders. It doesn't really tell the whole story. So we have a per capita GDP. Basically China and the US are about 22, 24 trillion dollars for its, its market value in a year. But that doesn't tell the whole story. If you divide the GDP by the number of people living in the country, you're going to see Americans come out to about $59,000 per capita GDP. Uh, Chinese, the average Chinese person comes out to around $10,000, $15,000. Uh, not nowhere near the, the profitability per person uh, or the wealth that America experiences. So GDP is great, but you got to look at per capita GDP. And if you take a look at this image here, you can see this is back in 2007. China has changed a little bit, but uh, at the time it was about $3,500 per person. Uh, the U.S., like I said, was somewhere around $60,000. Huge deal. Some other measures, CPI. If you ever watch the news, they talk about CPI. That's the Consumer Price Index. There's a certain number of goods, milk, bread, things like that, that is tracked as time goes on. I showed you a video last week where we saw Consumer Price Index. This woman goes into a store two months ago, spent $70 for the groceries, same groceries. She spent $92. So she was measuring what are the goods, how much are they costing? And because businesses and government understands that price increases happen every year, about 3%, uh, they generally will put a raise into people's salary. It's called a COLA or cost of living adjustment. So a lot of your parents receive a raise every year. It could be one, two, three, it could be more depending on what the company does and if they do any type of value added like uh, uh, bonus base. So if your parents do a good job, they can get an additional raise. So our, our system does recognize prices go up and many companies do pay more. Not all. Uh, you're talking to someone who doesn't get that 3% every year. Uh, but this graph right here does a pretty good job of showing how wages go up from 1990 to 2020. So this shows that there has been an increase uh, from uh, that, the 30-year period that we're talking about here uh, that tries to keep up with that 3% inflation. All right, now government is always worried about four big bad nasties. Recession, we saw the Great Recession during Obama's first term. That is two quarters, so we're talking six months, about half a year, of shrinking economic growth. In other words, the economy shrunk. Depression, like the Great Depression, is a lot worse. It's more than six months. It is a long term. We're talking years. Severe reduction in the economy. During the Great Recession, we saw unemployment as high as 15% in Nevada. During the Great Depression, we saw unemployment nationally around 25%. Our economic output dropped by 50% during the Great Depression, so much worse. Uh, right now we're dealing with inflation. That's faster than that normal 3% rise in consumer prices. Look at gas in the last four years, gone from $2.50 a gallon uh, to the Bay Area right now, which is $7 a gallon in some areas. Uh, and deflation. This is the drop in price of goods and services. People tend to hold on to their money in that situation. And you can see the inflation and deflation, it does tend to uh, vary as time goes on from our colonial times. 
really up until post-World War II, where deflation was heavily avoided. Uh, government policy was okay with inflation. It did everything it could to stop deflation. And so when the housing market collapsed, do you think the U.S. had inflation or deflation? Think about it. Come tell me what you think when you actually get back to school. Uh, the goal here, and we have a business cycle, is that on the bottom, we want, in a bad economy, consumers to feel more confident so that they're willing to spend more. When they spend more, more people are hired. The investment individuals and companies see this. They start putting more money in the stock market. That money is used to expand people's businesses, which hire more people. Stock market goes up. Salaries go up. That's the upward spiral that the government's shooting for. Let's transition a bit to taxes. And Oliver Wendell Holmes had said this, taxes are what we pay for civilized society. Great quote. Uh, they pay for a good portion of the goods and services you enjoy. Uh, from national defense to our first responders, health care, not only for the elderly, but for some of you receive government health care. And of course, public education. Now, Early taxes, like we're talking way back in history, the Egyptians, uh, cooking oil, uh, even slaves, you had a tax. And in some cases, you paid a tax with a slave if you were in the elite. Uh, the inheritance uh, in Russia, for example, beards, beehives, boots. Uh, if you grew a beard, uh, they would tax you. This is something that Peter the Great tried to do in order to move Russians away from the beard. Uh, and then uh, we would see in England, not only in 1695, but our own state in 1820, if you weren't married, you paid a tax. Where do you get the power? Now, some of you may have heard conspiracy theories that there is no power in the Constitution. Horse manure. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows our federal government the power to tax. And the 16th Amendment lets us provide for an income tax. So let's be clear. Taxes at the local, state, and federal levels, perfectly legal. Now, there are three kinds of taxes. There's the proportional tax, where everyone pays 10%. You can see that if you're only making 10000 a year, you're paying a grand. If you're making 180000 a year, you're paying 18000 You pay 10% no matter what. Regressive taxes actually take a larger percentage of income from people in lower income groups than from higher income groups. Not a lot of countries do regressive. So this may look a little familiar. Progressive, this is what we do. We have different tax brackets. So if you make 10 grand a year, you're going to pay 10%. If you make 180 grand a year, you're going to pay 32%. Our federal taxes are progressive. That means that the more you earn, the more you're going to pay the government. Here is the current tax rates. Uh, a lot of your parents are somewhere around here, either 12 or 22% uh, percent of their paycheck goes to Uncle Sam. All right, let's skip through this. Uh, what type of taxes? Well, number one, you have, as I said, an income tax. That's a percentage of what you earn on the job you have to pay. It's usually taken out monthly, and you have to pay in April, or you get a refund in April. Sales tax. You're going to pay that every time you buy a product or service. It's a simple percentage on what you buy. For example, Nevada has a sales tax of about 8.5%. Uh, property tax. So it's a tax on the physical property you own. You're going to pay it twice a year, although some people do have it set up for more than that. And capital gains, we talked about this in our finance unit. Uh, when you make profit, when you sell something, a stock, something like that, you have to pay a percentage on that. But you only pay it after you sell the investment. So that's important to keep in mind. And then just to give you an idea where a lot of the federal government money comes from, uh, most of it is personal income tax. Okay? Uh, 43% of all taxes are for that. 35% goes to Social Security, Medicare, things like that. Uh, we talked about customs, tariffs, things you know, such as. Uh, corporate income tax, only 7%. Uh, that can be kind of controversial. Uh, and where does it go? Social Security, all that, 38%. 20% goes to national defense. Uh, and if you take a look, just paying off the debt, the interest on the debt is 8%. Paying off the debt, I wish we were there. Uh, and a number of things. You can pause it and take a look. So just a reminder, if you pay too much, you get the extra money back. It's called a refund. Okay. And finally, go ahead and write this down. A deduction allows you to subtract money for your income. It leaves you less tax to pay. Your mortgage can be a deduction. Um, retirement plans, children. Uh, if you have any questions, 
please let me know in class. I'd love to be able to help you. Uh, and uh, make sure you pay your